Wild Man Energy. I'm your host, Flint Anderson. If this is your first time with us, thank you for joining us. I hope you find something of value and a reason to come back. And if you have come back to the insanity that is my podcast and is my life, then thank you for spending even more time with us. If you do not already like and subscribe to the podcast, make sure you do that. We put content out every Thursday at 5 a.m. Eastern time, and there's bonus episodes that drop randomly whenever I feel like it. Also, if you don't follow me on social media, I post content daily that is different content on all different platforms. So today we have a real treat. I made a post about a week, week and a half ago on Instagram. We'll put the link to it down here, but basically talking about men's feelings and how men don't have a lot of value except for what we provide to each other and, and to our families. And got an interesting response back from a female, no less, that was supposed to be real sensitive and open to men's feelings and basically just, well, didn't go the way we expected. And so you guys are some of the ones that responded with us. We've invited several people. Some people may be popping in and out as they have time. But what I'd like you each to do and each of the guests that's with us, please introduce yourself. I'm going to ask you to start, Josh, and tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from. And what drew you to respond on that particular post? Sweet, yeah. I'm Josh Canalora. On social media, you might see me as Uncle Joshy. I've known Flint, I don't know, a couple of years now. We met via social media doing 75 hard and just old man energy type shit. We clicked and I've been married, holy crap, 28 years this year. Got three kids. My kids are. 18, 20, and 24. My youngest just graduated high school. We live in Northern California. My wife is a licensed clinical social worker. She is an LSW. She currently is the director of care coordination. She oversees two different hospitals here in Northern California, one in Red Bluff and one up in Mount Shasta. I am a marriage and family therapist. I am finishing up my I just finished my first year. I got two years left of graduate school to get my master's degree in psychology. And then I will begin practicing full-time marriage and family therapy. So this post particularly drew me because I feel like there's a lot of dialogue and a lot of chatter and a lot of noise about mental health, feelings, value, worth. And a lot of ideas get tossed around that I don't think are really fleshed out. And I think my exact comment or very close to was, wow, there's a lot to unpack here. (laughs) And I didn't get into it in the post because, again, it's you did a very good job articulating, I think, what you were getting at. But social media is hit and miss. And so, yeah. So I know Flint and I was like, you know, if we want to dialogue, we'll dialogue in person. He's like, screw it. Let's do a podcast. So Dave Murphy on uh, Instagram lifting machine, 50 years old. So I think I qualify as old man. Bachelor's in business management, master's in kinesiology. My, my exit ramp to retirement is essentially hopefully owning and operating my own gym as I seek to get out of the uh, IT industry, which is kind of where I, I primarily have resided for the last 25 or so years. That might be Josh. I might actually be your neighbor. I am also in Northern California. So when you say Red Bluff and Shasta, I, I know exactly what you're talking about because I'm about 45 minutes to an hour away from there. Yeah. Yeah. So um, anyway, what, you know, what drew me to the post, I honestly, I didn't see the response from the, the woman you're talking about. I was, you know, I I think I chimed in right away on just the, the premise of, you know, basically men aren't valued again until they provide somebody something. Right. And my response to you, and I I think what, what interested you was it, you know, if you went back to my teenage years, I mean, I was a basement dwelling keyboard warrior. Right. And very much on the road to what we would call an, in, an incel today, right? That has a hard time forming relationships with women and society in general and goes down those dark holes and conspiracy paths, right? So 
but I, I managed to break out of that. And so I, I think, you know, maybe that's, that's kind of my offering today on the, on this podcast, right. Is, is maybe a positive message, but also sharing my experience of, yeah, feeling that worthlessness, right. Just, just living that. And so, yeah, that's what, that's why I responded. And that's why yeah, I definitely wanted to have a chance to, to talk. I'm Brian Williamson. My wife and I live out in San Angelo, Texas. She's a marketing director for a, an online women's fitness company. And I do floor maintenance and restoration, which is sort of a, an extension of my time with Flint way back when he had the, the cleaning business out in Jacksonville. I've known him for a little over 30 years. His dad and my mom got married back in 91, so we've been, we've been family for a long time. Kind of what drew me to that post, just because of how I was raised and, you know, Flint saw some of this, I, I kind of struggled with purpose and, you know, what it was to be a, be a man and, you know, what kind of roles a man should fulfill. And I've just, I've struggled with that most of my life. And it's just been in the last, you know, few years that I've kind of started to understand and accept some of the things that I, you know, I, that I didn't understand before. And that post kind of, kind of resonated with me. It, he, you know, Flint shared some views in that post that spoke to what I've been feeling, but couldn't quite articulate. And um, so I'll, you know, I'll probably be cool to hop on and join a conversation about it. Awesome. Awesome guys. I, you all contributed a lot to that. And that post was obviously deeply emotionally felt. I've since had a conversation with the response that led to that post to the, to the lady that made that response. And she's helped clarify it a little bit. It was not her intention to come across the way she did. And her, her response is typical of, of not of females in general, but just of people. And one thing we, we for, tend to forget is that we can only communicate from our level of understanding, but we also can only understand communication from our level of understanding. So it's easy to lose stuff in the translation. It's easy to get feelings hurt. So it's real important to clarify. But honestly, this, that response led to a much bigger issue than, than just, okay, well, you didn't understand what I meant. It, my, my position has been pretty clearly stated over the years that, excuse me, I don't believe men have, they were not born with inherent value. We cannot propagate the species. We cannot create humans. And therefore, we have to create our own value as we grow. And a lot of us have come to understand that. We don't, I don't have a problem with that necessarily. It just is the way it is. But that tends to set some people off, some weaker men. And some women specifically tend to take offense to that. But whenever you start drilling down into the topic, they find they they find that it, if you can get past the, off, the the offense that they're taking, then you find that okay, well maybe they really do feel that way, but they don't like it much about themselves. So when emotions start getting involved in anything, and Josh, you probably know more about this than any of us in here, but when emotions start getting involved, we tend to stop thinking clearly, and then that leads into men's mental health issues, where one of the most sobering statistics in men's mental health right now is every 13, point se 13 minutes and seven seconds, another man commits suicide in America. He loses the battle with the demons in his head. That is a terrifying statistic. So this really opened a giant can of worms. The status, I, I, one of the questions I've got is, what, what do you believe is the biggest challenge? And I'm going to go in reverse order this time. Brian, I'm going to ask you to start, but what do you believe or what have you found personally to be the biggest challenge with either the way men are treated or the way you've had to come realize your own, I'd fight our own demons for lack of a better term. What, what do you think the biggest challenge facing men in America or in society is today or, and personally, what have you dealt with? If you're willing to share some of that. 
probably start with personally since I, I can speak to that better. I know that, you know, I kind of, I kind of came up and I didn't, didn't know it for a long time, didn't realize it, but I, I, I came up with a, you know, kind of a, a sense of entitlement and that things just happen. You know, it should just be handed to me or to anyone. Well, on some level, that never felt quite right, but that's just kind of how I, you know, my world took shape early on. And it's been a very challenging time coming to understand and accept that that's not how the world works. Probably shouldn't work. And you know, trying to find ways to work through that. You know, as far as, you know, what men, you know, face the most. I'm not entirely sure I can, can, can speak to that, but it, but it does seem like there seems to be a certain, you know, a certain confusion around what masculinity means, what the, the role of men should be in society these days. And, you know, some just uh, just some some negative you know opinions and of masculinity in general if that makes sense what about you Doug? classic zoom i mean yeah so one it's easy for me to go off tangent by the way just uh, a little bit of adhd uh, so but I'll, I'll try not to do that so some of the biggest challenges at least you know just speaking to what, what i've encountered but also just you, you know my children right and now recognizing patterns early on from my childhood and my parents, right, is one basically admit that we might have a history of family problems, right? Like a grandfather that was an alcoholic and then, you know, a father that was maybe a porn addict and then so on and so forth, right? These, these things don't just necessarily disappear. So that's one aspect that I think has a problem. I think, you know, in, in terms of us getting help and in terms of our, you know, health as, as men in society. The other challenge that I, again, personally had was, you know, especially from the 70s and 80s, right? It's just a complete and utter disbelief that mental health was a thing, that men could suffer mental health challenges. And, and I'll, you know, and, and we may talk about this or explore this further, but I'll give you one example of that is, is I, I am on the spectrum. Right. So when you, when you take my ADD in, in, into account and my, you know, my autistic spectrum into account, like it makes perfect sense that I'm in the IT world. Okay. Numbers and logic and just, I just immediately gravitated to that, but, but I'm also, but also it's like mechanical stuff. But anyway, one of the symptoms common with autism is walking on your tiptoes. Okay. And I did walk on my tiptoes as a child. But again, because of that resistance to, well, this could be something beyond just, you know, this physical manifestation. They treated the physical manifestation of, of a, a brain problem, right? And what they did is they put me in shoes to correct my tiptoe walking, which it did do. But now imagine right now going through all of childhood, early adulthood, not knowing that there's, you know, something kind of different in how I view and think things because it was all covered up physically. Right. So your, your belief system, I think society's belief systems, you know, cause I, I don't, my parents were conservative, but I don't want to necessarily label that as a conservative parent problem because I think it's just how people are. And I think especially in the seventies and eighties, again, I think it was a time where we didn't have access to information. There weren't TikToks being produced every day of people struggling with mental health challenges and actually talking to therapists and being able to put that stuff out. So it was just voodoo, right? As far as my parents are concerned, it's voodoo. So yeah, I, I think those types of things have, have made it very challenging for men to get help. 
and, and as someone who I, I went through facial paralysis last year, I got struck with Bell's palsy. So the whole right side of my face was paralyzed. Okay. And I, I went into probably what I would consider my first real depressive spiral. I mean, like just don't want to get out of bed, don't want to work out, like don't want to function. Right. And finding a therapist that would treat me was next to impossible, right? That I could actually talk to and walk through this like new phenomenon and restrictions that I have was painstakingly difficult. And by the way, had to do that while depressed, <laughs> right? <laughs> so there's the other challenge, right? Is, is as men, you know, I can't offload that challenge. I ha I have to still go to work. I still have to, you know, and so that's maybe the, the, the further issue here is, is we're still expected to go to work. We're still expected to function as if everything's normal. Not that other people aren't, but as an example, I called into a clinic or a clinician that treated mainly women and they're like, yeah, we can't see you. I'm like, yeah, but I'm kind of really desperate. <laughs> Like, eh, you're not really our customer profile. Cool, right? Next, it, you know, thank God, you know, I did finally get a hold of somebody, but it, it took weeks longer than I had expected. And then, you know, Brian, I took notes, you know, it's something we can touch on. I also grew up, I would say, with an odd sense of entitlement. I was both entitled, but not meaning I started working at 14, but even once I started working, I definitely felt I was probably entitled to more than what I was outputting at work, if that makes sense. So I, I totally agree. I went, I went through that stage very much. So that's a lot of pieces. Absolutely. We definitely want to revisit some of that. Josh, there was, uh, there's a reason I wanted you to go after the other two spoke and I'm in my positions pretty well clarified. One thing I'd like you to add, Josh, is, is what you're going to school for. I've recently graduated. Can you clarify that? Because I think that's really relevant to this conversation. Yeah. So a little over a year ago, I graduated with my bachelor's in psychology from California, California State University, Chico. And then I applied to and was accepted to their master's program. It's called the MFT program, which is marriage and family therapy. It's a three-year program to get your master's degree in psychology. After two years of academic work, so I've completed my first year, I have one more year of academic work. Your third school year, it, they call it a school year, but you're actually working full-time as a therapist. So actually right now I'm considered an MFT. I'm considered a marriage and family therapist. I've already began taking clients at the school. So for my third year, I'll be working full-time. And after you get so many hours you graduate, turn in your hours, you can apply to take a test, then you have to accumulate more hours, you take another test, and then you get your license, and then you can go out under your own license. So right now I'm operating under someone else's license, but I'm a marriage and family therapist. So Dave's story, unfortunately right now, is not rare. I hear that every day. Every day I hear from Teenagers, friends, colleagues, people online, they're willing to try therapy. They're willing to go get some help. They're willing to do the work. Everybody's booked. There's wait lists. There's two, three, four month wait lists. Um, then some people are only available via Zoom. Some people prefer to be in, in, in person. So it's there's a huge shortage. And this is another can of worms we can get to later. But I think COVID... And the lockdown, I think, created a huge cluster, and we are going to see a mental health fallout from all of those elementary, junior high, and high school kids that got thoroughly shit-canned during all of that when they're told to stay at home in those formative years when they're supposed to be playing and digging in the dirt. I mean, they, they already have the setback of technology taking their time, but then you stuck them in a house by themselves for two years, it's a mess. And we're already starting to see that. So yeah, marriage and family therapy, therapist. That's, that's what my whole field is. My, I plan to spend the next 40 years, as long as my brain is functioning 
and I can hold the thought, I plan to spend the next 40 plus years helping as many Daves and Brian's and teenagers, married, I don't care, I'll help anybody. But that's my goal. And a lot of that comes from, like what Brian and Dave have shared. Yeah, I was born in 77, so I grew up in the 80s, in the 90s, you know, that Gen X, uh, you know, go outside and play and, you know, cut yourself or hurt yourself, suck it up like a man, big boys don't cry, uh, you know, that's mommy's brave boy, you know, don't be afraid of the dark, you know, don't be a wuss, you know, don't wear a helmet, helmets are for sissies, all this stuff that now, I think you kind of see the flip side, you know, my opinion, yes, I'm very pro mental health, I'm very pro, let's talk about things, but I think we kind of we push the pendulum always swings, right? And it swung in one direction for so long. And now the things that are pissing people off, it's because that pendulum swung the other way. Right. And so we got to find that balance of like, Hey, being a man is okay. It's okay to say man. It's okay to say woman. It's okay to like say these things. And, and we won't even get into the, yes, you can be non-binary, all the other things, but identify as a man Men can have feelings. Men can have emotions. Anybody can. But what do we do with those in a healthy way? So that's my goal is to educate men on what those feelings are, where those come from, and what to do with them so we can function. So a great quote that really resonates with me and I think would really resonate with a lot of you guys is years ago, we were in the thick of it, you know, and I grew up poor. Northern California, my mom divorced my dad. I'm the oldest of eight kids. My mom, when her and my dad divorced, kind of spiraled, got into drugs. And she eventually died at the age of 53. She died almost a little over 10 years ago now. Just did not do well. So I grew up welfare, food stamps, back when they came in the envelopes in the mail. You know, Mom was a smoker, so she'd send us to the store with a couple of dollar food stamps to buy candy, get the change, accumulate enough change from the food stamps to go buy a pack of cigarettes. So I, very broke, very poor, Northern California, conservative, lots of religion, lots of baggage. And coming out of that, I didn't know how to parent. And so here I am. I got three kids. My oldest is like 14 or 15 at the time, and my middle was like 12. My youngest was like 10. And man, I was struggling. And somebody said something and that just resonated with me. And, you know, coming from all that baggage broke all the, my goal was I wanted my kids to have what I never had. You know, how many of us have said that, you know, I want my kids to have the things I never got to have. I didn't get to have the big wheel. I never had Capri Suns. I never got Lunchables. You know, I, you, I want them to have all the things I didn't have. So we're in this mess. And somebody, I don't know if it was Instagram, social media, or somebody just told me, they said, quit trying to give your kids stuff you never had. Teach them what you never knew. Man, it doesn't matter what you buy. You can buy your kids all kinds of shit. It's going to be in a garage sale or the dumpster someday, right? Or in a box, memories, whatever. The sooner I can start teaching them shit, the sooner I can start educating them. What does it mean to be a man? How do you treat a partner? How do you deal with your feelings? Hey, it's okay to be pissed off and rage, but what do you do in that rage? Do you punch a wall or do you go lift some weights? You know, like teach your kids they didn't what you didn't know so we can start jumping that curb. So for me, that's why, and maybe this post really stood out to me, is I still think there's just a lot of misconceptions about what do we mean when we say mental health? What do we mean when we say value or worth, right? Like, oh, so you're saying I'm worthless because blah, blah. No, man. I think having these conversations, though, is the first step. Having the dialogue, talking about things, educating people. When you say ADHD or this on the spectrum, how helpful would that have been for you, Dave, not to, to correct the feet? But maybe to embrace the diagnosis, not because you're broken or there's something wrong with you, but so we can get you the highest functioning level as soon as possible. Nobody gives the kid shit. That's, you know what I mean? It's like your kid goes to the doctor and your doctor's like, hey, they have a rare leukemia. Nobody's like, oh, let's not talk about it. 
well, let's keep that private. <laughs> they're on Kickstarter. They're, you know, St. Jude Hospital, balloons. Why? It's not the kid's fault. Just like it's not Dave's fault that he was born on the spectrum or had ADHD. It's genetics, bitch. Like, it happens. You won the genetic lottery the other way. So <laughs> let's figure it out so we can get you going. You know what I mean? So I, I think talking about it, educating people, taking away the stigma and the shame and just owning your shit so we can get going and get healthy so we can start jumping that curve, man. I want my kids... Here's a quote for you. You can put this on Instagram. This is probably the best quote I'm ever going to have my whole life. I want to be twice the man my father was and half the man my sons will be. I want to be twice the man my father was, but only half the man my sons will be. Man, I want them to, I, I want to tear shit up, me personally, but I want them to run even further, faster, faster, higher, stronger. I want them to do shit that I was only thinking about while I'm doing twice as good as what was handed me. No bitching, no complaining. Just, I want to be twice the man my dad was, but I want to be half the man my boys are going to be. That's a great quote. I'll say, Josh, I, I do, I 100% agree with the, uh, coming from a knowledge perspective versus a stuff perspective. I remember, you know, my dad basically, uh, he, he's passed away by the way for about seven years. But one of the things he had hoped was uh, like, yeah, I can't, I'm just going to try to stick around until you got teenagers because I, I was, a, my sister and I were both <laughs> problematic teenagers. But guess what? Why do you think we were problematic uh, teenagers, Josh? Because undiagnosed shit. I mean, right? I got some guesses. Well, knowing, you know, why would an ADD kid play with fire and climb on school roofs? I oh, don't shit. know. You know? I mean, fire and roofs are cool shit for Doesn't everybody. Oh, just throwing that out so I think, there. Isn't, yes. that, isn't that a guy thing? I don't know if that's ADD. But maybe not to the level you were doing. Well, yeah, we, we could get into that. Not to the <laughs> level I was doing, sir. I, I will definitely say that. They were not kids in elementary school doing <laughs> that, the That's part of your story doing. you haven't shared with us yet. Yeah. But my teenagers uh, and now young adults, I had zero problems with. Because guess what? Kind of figuring out that, hey, I've got problems. We, di- we got them diagnosed and evaluated early on so that, hey, guess what? Yeah, they have, you know, stimulus problems. They have food, food texture issues, right? Things that we were able to address with knowledge, not stuff. And we, I, greatest teenagers, I think anyone could ask for. No problems whatsoever. Again, I don't even have to, t- you know, as you heard, my son it's just great, takes man. out the trash. That's just, so great. Everything's, you know, like I had no fights. Yeah, it's, it's been awesome way different than my childhood that's awesome there's the the next thing i'm gonna want to talk i'm gonna share something but i'm gonna tell you guys what i want to talk about next is uh, because it it, everybody's touched on this just a little bit but the the importance of male friendship and a tribe of guys around us is is going to be the next question we're i have seven children all adults now so i can relate to what you two have talked about but brian and i've been talking recently because we have elderly parents and we've reconnected a little bit on that and having to deal with that on the other side of things. And one quote that resonated with me, I shared it with him because I really, really was struggling in my, uh, obviously we have separate moms, but my mom's not doing very well at all. And there was a lot of resentment just growing up and challenges with parents and being angry at them. And as, as guys, we tend to stuff our emotions because that's what we were taught when we were younger. And it really was very cathartic for me to realize that, you know, we're, this is all of us just our first run. Our parents didn't get a practice trial run when they were raising us. It's their first time through it too. And that really instantly, no learning curve, gave me a sense of patience and perspective with my parents and a crap ton of forgiveness. They didn't know what they were doing. They didn't have any idea. They was they were trying to figure it out, same as we're trying to figure it out right now. I get a little emotional about that because I carried a lot of resentment around for a lot of years and it was incredibly easy to let go. Once I realized that they weren't doing it on purpose, we're all broken in one way or another. And I hate to say that people are broken. That is not what I mean. But we all have our issues in one way or another. We all have things that we struggle with. And the further back you go, sometimes the worse it gets. But whether we carry that around with us or not is up to us. We're more connected as a society now than we ever have been. And without exception, everybody on this podcast, myself included, and I'm, my story has been shared extensively, so I'm not, if you guys want to hear any piece of it, then let me know. But 
each of you touch base on struggling with mental health or with depression or with being just, just struggling with different pieces of either growing up or whatever, whatever it was and not getting the help that we needed. We all struggled with that as a result. And then Josh, you hit this perfectly as we are, we're incredibly well connected, but we're more isolated than ever. And COVID really led to the exacerbation of that on an exponential scale. I agree with you. I saw it happen in my own children that were at the house and it was terrible. And they're still dealing with it to this day, even though they're adults. So I, I'm curious, I really believe that it is important for us in a society to have a, a tribe of men around us that we trust, that we can be open with. Josh, you and I have talked about this specifically, this topic about we need a safe place and not the safe space where we can go and feel sorry for ourselves, but a safe place where we can be vulnerable and know that we're going to get truth back. Whether that truth is harsh reality or whether that truth is acceptance and love, but we're going to get what we need. And I, it's something that only other men can provide. I'm curious to everybody's opinion on that. So much to say on that. And let me start with this. Absolutely. I think, you know, I, you're so, I'm glad you brought up what you did about elderly parents. We're going through that right now with Gloria's dad. He's 91. It's a kind of a shit show, but everything you just said resonates. And I too had this epiphany, fortunately, before my mom died, we were on great terms when she died, no resentment or bitterness, but a lot of what helped that is realizing she didn't know what the hell she was doing. Jesus Christ, she was 17 when I was born. Like it was her first time, my first time, like it is what it is. You know, part of that is having the realization that, like you said, we get one trial on, this is it. But all of that being said, you need people in your life. And when I look at my dad and yeah, he screwed up a lot, but he, there was some good things there too. But when I look at his life specifically, what really stands out to me, what's really wild, he did not have close guy friends. He would hang out with the husbands of the wives that were all friends with my mom. My mom had girlfriends. They, she had great friends, phone for hours in the kitchen while they're cooking, baby on the hip, talking at the grocery store, whatever. My mom had really great friends. They'd pour out soul, everything, share everything with. My dad would just hang out around the barbecue maybe with some other, you know, with the husbands. Or they might hang out as couples, but the guys just kind of sat there. The women did all the talking. He didn't have good friends. I think he only had like one, somebody he'd call a best friend from high school that they didn't even, wasn't even a regular part of our life growing up. So I look at all the shit that he's gone through, still goes through today. He doesn't have a big circle. I don't even know if that's, dude has a circle. And something that was really key with my wife from day one is transparency and communication and honesty. You know, we don't hold shit from each other, honest about everything. We communicate but you need guys too. You need a circle apart from your spouse. Having a good marriage is great, but you need guys that you can get in. I'm fortunate. I have some guys that we work out four or five days a week. We go in my garage. We lift weights. We talk about kids. We talk about sex. We talk about depression. We talk about when we fuck up. We talk, I mean, we, nothing is off the table, right? And what is so critical though is you need guys to call you out on your junk and to be honest because only when those guys call you out on your stuff do you believe them when they're encouraging you when you're going through something, right? If you just got a bunch of dudes around you all the time that are like, oh, yeah, you're the best, dude. Oh, dude, you're you're amazing. Oh, you're great. You're great. We, we know yes men. We don't need yes men. We need dudes around me going, you know you can lift heavier than that or – I complain about something, a fight my wife and I had. And then after they listen, they go, well, you were kind of a dick. It sounds like your wife was right. Right? Like, I need that. I need guys to just call me on my junk and say, yeah, maybe, you know, maybe you should do this. Or, you know, maybe your kid was right. Maybe you overreacted because my kids do that all the time. That's normal. And I am only the man that I am now and the husband I am because for the last five years consistently – I've had these two guys, Mark and Dustin, that I know they're going to show up. If I call them for something, if I need advice, need what, same. And it goes both ways. And these are guys that I've only known for about five years. 
but they're right or dies and, and they'll shoot it to me straight and they'll tell me the truth. But I'm a better man, better husband, a better human because of the, those relationships, those honest communications of being able to go, oh, OK, that's normal. Oh, OK. It's not just me. I'm not totally screwed up, like critical, critical. Brian, what's your opinion on that? I do think it's I personally don't know that I can speak to what that's like because I've never really had that. Maybe it's the maybe it's the absence of that or the lack of consistency of having it that I recognize the, the importance of having it. That's uh, that that speaks to it just as powerfully as what Josh said. Dave, what about you? I definitely definitely agree with Josh. Although I I'm like wow, I kind of sound like your dad right now because <laughs> yeah, I I, I had you could call it a line of friends. I don't you know, I don't have enough for a circle. And it's, it's often been challenging because I think at least the people I interact with, what I would call the male ego, and it's something we might touch on about, you know, this, this desire of insecure men to come out as alphas, you know, alphas, which I same term, but I run into a lot of insecure men that will outwardly project what they feel as masculinity. And I've found them to be very untrustworthy. So. And maybe it's, it's the problem of my social circles, you know, whatever it is. I know, you know, I have at least one guy. He was a lifting partner. Also, you know, met him through our spouses, right? They were friends and then met him at our, you know, a couple of events. And I've known him for a while and, and we, we lifted and did competitive powerlifting together for 10 years. So he's, he's definitely a, you know, a guy that just killed somebody would help me bury the body, I'm sure. But that's few and far between. I have connected with an old high school friend who's actually just, you know, I, I was, I was looking for investors in my, my gym and it was like, shit, I'll, I'll just call him up. Right. <laughs> Cause I get, I don't know anybody. And yeah, he, you know, he's like, I'm there dude. And he pitched in and, you know, and we've, we've talked for, for several years after reconnecting on social media. So, you know, I have maybe, yeah, two or three guys that I can, you know, get advice from, divulge information to, just be open around. And that's, and that's about it. Because, yeah, the, this seems like the last few people I've, I've tried to go down that avenue or, or, or let in, take the barriers down a little bit, just, just screwed me over. <laughs> so, so it's tough. And then to the, you know, to the parent thing that, that you guys brought up. Yeah, it's, it took me until my mid-30s to be able to at least tell my mother, yeah, I love you, Mom. Because I was holding, I held resentment that long from childhood. And then my, my parents lived in Ohio because we moved out there from Arizona and I had to listen to my father's mental decline. You know, he would call me up from the hospital and tell me to come pick him up. Right. And I'm like, I've been to California, dad, can't do that. But I did at least have the chance and this is definitely something that I want to get across is if you have that opportunity to you know, speak to your parent, even if there's a history of resentment and frustration, right? As you said, they didn't know, right? As an adult, I can look back and go, they had no idea. They, again, medicine was behind the curve. Mental health was behind the curve. It's just, there was no way for them to recognize that I had, you know, neurodivergent tendencies to, to address. It was always hormones or too much caffeine growing up, right? I learned to not begrudge them for that. I learned to forgive them for that. And I had the chance, at least before my father, you know, before his mental decline, uh, he was in the hospital for leukemia therapy to, to have him sit down and kind of hash things out. I'm thankful for that because I know a lot of people have lost their parents. They're like, God, I wish I had just said the thing, right? Or got this off my chest and hash it out. And so I, I definitely encourage people to do that, regardless of how much again, so you think it's there in the past, because it's, it's very cathartic. Still, obviously, brings up emotions, but definitely, you gotta, you gotta forgive them, because it's their first time, it's my first time, you just don't know what you don't know. We've made it a point with our children to never end a conversation without saying I love you. I never wanted the last thing out of my mouth to my children. If that I were to go away I, right after that to be anything other than that, to the point where as adults now, it's kind of a joke, even though they all do it and not a joke that we say it, but 
they will talk about me fussing at them on the phone and just going off. And then immediately my voice changes when it's time to get off the phone. Okay, well, love you. Bye. And <laughs> they knew they were in trouble, but they also knew that, that we cared about them, that we loved them. This brings up a, this brings up a, good, a, a good transition as far as if you don't get these things off your chest, if you don't have a safe space to talk about them, and we've all, I can't speak for everybody, most of us have been in relationships where if we've chosen to be vulnerable, that it is then turned and weaponized against us. And this is probably the number one thing that I hear from guys whenever I'm having one-on-one -on -one conversations with. And without exception, it's, it's true. The reason that they don't open up is because it could cost them their family if their wife got pissed off at them, if their girlfriend got pissed off at them, it could cost them their children. Or at the very least, it's thrown in their face as a sign of weakness. That speaks to several things. It could speak to a lack of vulnerability among men today, and it could speak to a bunch of weak men out there, but also it could speak to a, an entire generation that really doesn't know how to have a healthy relationship. But whatever it speaks to, it's led to a generation of men who don't talk, who even if they're feeling that the world would be better if they put a bullet in their brain pan, they don't talk about it. And I, I get emotional with that because there's a lot of guys out there that are hurting and there's a lot of guys that don't have anywhere to turn. There's a lot of guys that are isolated, whether, I mean, let's face it, as we get older, the world demands more of us. We're fathers. We have a career. Like, like Dave said, we, even if we're depressed, we have to work. We kids depend on us. Family depends on us. And so we isolate ourselves even more. So instead of talking about problems, and of course we can talk about the problems some more, but I'm curious. If you guys have any ideas for solutions, what do you think would be a good or effective solution or even a start towards a solution? Dave, you want to lead us off on that one? Yeah. I'll, I'll try, to, try to condense it as much as I can. Um, but, you know, going from that, again, kind of basement dwelling mentality and angry at the world, right? Angry at my, where I am in life, you know, now knowing where that frustration came from, right? But how I got out of that spiral and kind of to the, the tenor of the original topic, right, was finding, finding the value of myself, right? I think ultimately only we can do that, but it, it does take some external validation at some point. And, and what I mean by that is I grew up, in, unfortunately, a very hairy man in the metrosexual era, era, right? I mean, that's the chest hair, back hair, right? I'm a hairy Scotsman. As okay. I, we all are, I think. So you're and, speaking to the crowd here. <laughs> yeah. And so, but, you know, it seemed like every, every girl growing up wanted, you know, a lean, athletic, hairless body was their ideal image, right? So I never fit in. I never connected with anyone. And I thought lifting weights and getting big as a teen and young adult would help that, right? And, and I've... I started having these discussions with kids that I see fitting that profile here because it's, it's, a, it's a false sense of security, right? It's a, it's a false confidence. And it didn't help me sit down and speak with anyone anymore. It didn't make me more interesting. Lifting, sorry, doesn't necessarily make you more interesting. You know, you still have personality stuff. You still have to find a, a worth. Lifting weights is not providing value to anybody. It does yourself health wise. It may have secondary effects of like, hey, I can play with my kids and hike and, and, and be active and stuff. But as a, as a young man, I didn't understand that. And so it wasn't until I got my first job, you know, at like 14, it wasn't a sexy job. It was folding clothes, fly, you know, like a, a women's club store. It was a great job. But, you know, to give you an idea of, of how the world perceived me as at the time, after working there for a couple of years, literally one of the one of the gals that worked there came up and said, "You know, you're actually a really nice guy, but I thought you were a serial killer, right?" I mean, imagine <laughs> hearing that at like 17. Like, here's the, I'm thinking like I'm dressing cool, like I'm dressing stylish, and like you know, again, outwardly nice, but this external perception because simply because of like my glasses and haircut, right? I literally had like the Jeffrey Dahmer glasses at the time. There's nothing I could do about that. It's just I didn't know, right? It was like, yeah, you look like a serial killer, but you're actually a really nice guy. Gosh, like, okay. So anyway, eventually I found 
my my niche thankfully you know in, in the it space the computer space right started i got a desktop support and just like dove into it like it scratched all the rights itches in my brain as again someone with adhd and, and on the spectrum to the point where you know a few years into that career people start start coming to me for answers and that's essentially the that was the turning point where i'm now recognizing that i am providing value to society right i'm no longer isolated i'm no longer just dave wondering what's going on i i have i have mostly mastered a topic and a topic that people need knowledge about and now they have they have they come seek me for that knowledge and then you know that just it's like that was a that was honestly a light bulb okay once i got into the right field once i got into the right line of work that aligned with my thought processes and and what i could personally deal with and, and the types of people i could interact with etc things just things just took off and and my life you know made like a big u-turn from where it was going and to contrast that right i had a i had a friend that was very charismatic and had that athletic build and was a ladies man and if we went to spring break, like he was hooking up with, he could hook up with people nightly and had all of spring break fun. And he, he just was good looking. So he could walk into a place like Abercrombie and Fish and they're like, yeah, we want you. Right. So, so he had this value to society because he was attractive. Right. I, I would call that a true value. It's still very surface level, but that, you know, that gave him a, a earlier sense of confidence to go tackle career things that it did me, right? It took, it wasn't until my mid twenties where I realized, oh yeah, I know stuff and I know more stuff than the people in my field. And so employers want me, right? I can now earn a consultant firm. I can earn them money because of my knowledge, right? Or I can save a firm money because of my knowledge, whatever that is. And so that's, that's my personal journey out of that kind of pit of despair and, and misdirection and where am I going was, was just exploring a lot of niches until it, I hit one that, that I could gravitate towards and really dive headfirst into, right? If, cause, cause I see it, I, I'm sure we've all seen it a lot of times where people will go after the dollar signs, right? Oh, I'm, I'm going to go get a degree in this, or I'm going to go study this, or I'm going to go build houses or whatever, because there's money in it, but you only go, you can only last so long in that because it's not just it doesn't speak to your inner being right it's, it's not something you are wholeheartedly ready to dive into you know josh right like you're excited you're like i'm doing this thing i'm getting my master's degree like you're passionate about it right and it probably took you a little bit of time to figure that out but that's where you want to be and it, it just feels right to you and the security the the, the it stuff cyber security stuff felt right to me and then once i started coaching uh, for the last 10 years, that felt even more right, where I had, you know, interpersonal con um, connections I'd never had an opportunity to have before. Again, people seeking my knowledge of, of fitness now, instead of just IT work. Um, and now, you know, getting more satisfaction out of seeing a person grow than fixing a technical problem, right? There's, it's, it's cool that I can fix, you know, some kind of computer glitch issue out there, but it's way cooler to take, you know, a, a 50 year old mom who has a, you know, a challenge keeping up with her grandkids and getting her strong and fit and healthy to where she's able to crawl on the floor and, you know, do all this cool stuff, like way more satisfaction and, and now even more passion that I can, you know, put into that. Um, so I don't, I don't, that might be a circumspect way of answering that question, was, but your, your um, story, your story is what it is. That's yeah. fair. <laughs> I mean, we all, we all write our story with our own pen. So how we, how we deal with it is how we deal with it. Brian, Josh, which one of you guys wants to go next? Uh, Brian, go for it, man. Uh, although I do have a question for Brian. So, and this is right in line with what Clint was asking us. So from what I heard, it's like your, your circle is more like a line or you don't have like a ton of people. And Flint, if I remember your question, it's like, you know, well, what do you do when there's this fear, like you want to talk about it, but it might be used against you or weaponized or it can come back and bite you in the ass. So I'm curious when you're having these realizations, Brian, when you're like, yeah, that was the way I was brought up. That was 
kind of bullshit. Like some of the things that I was taught and how I was led to believe things that were normal as you're processing and having these realizations that, hey, I don't want to think that way anymore. or I don't want that to be the way I live anymore. What what do you do or what does that look like? How has that journey been for you? You know, so, I mean, so far, I'll say, you know, since I really, I guess, started becoming more aware of, of all of this and trying to navigate my way through it, you know, it's my wife has been the, the one person I've probably talked to the most because I didn't, you know, there, there wasn't anyone else that I felt that I felt comfortable enough talking about with that sort of thing. And I hope that will excuse me for that because I know we talked about stuff like that a long time ago. I went through a spell of several years where uh, just because of how I was feeling and choices that I made, I kind of deliberately or accidentally uh, disconnected myself from practically everyone. And, you know, the last few years I've, I've gotten back into doing martial arts and I have a, you know, a small group of people here in town that I'm trained with on a regular basis. But you know, again, I was struggling with interpersonal relationships in general and, you know, not making good decisions for, for a long time. I, you know, I didn't feel comfortable, in, you know, talking to some of those guys and, you know, there's, I've experienced some conflicts, you know, here and there because of who I was at any given time and, you know, who, who they are. And, you know, as time has gone on, I've, you know, I've, I've opened up to some of them more, but, you know, I, I don't know if it's a consequence of how it was showing up early on or if, you know, if it speaks to something about them, but a lot of times I do get a sense that, you know, some of what I shared, you know, trying to be more open and work through this with other men, that maybe some of that's being used to kind of manipulate things or to, you know, kind of, I guess, give some, there's not a, there may be some, there may be some, some element of, you know, calling each other on our bullshit, so to speak, but it's in a, it takes place in a way that I don't know if that's actually the case or if it's, you know, the stuff that I share is being against me somehow. So, I mean, you know, as of right now, I do, I do try to share share things with you know a few of those guys still um, practice. Um, you know, my wife is probably still you know my primary you know, source of discussion. We've had similar struggles, and you know we've had our own problems, and so we've kind of we've kind of grown up together in a way. But other than that, it's, you know, it's a lot of just trying to work it out on my own, really. Sounds very typical. Before you enter, Josh, let me say something real quick. No apology necessary, Brian. You don't owe me anything. We were, we were incredibly close for a lot of years. And we both wanted brothers that we could be close to. And when our parents got married, we were, we were inseparable for a long time. Even after I grew up, moved away, we still stayed in touch and contact. I've got sheaves of emails back and forth just talking about stuff and growing up. And through a series of decisions, some of them mine, some of them his, he put a lot of that on his shoulders. You know, I'm, I'm as much to blame for that estrangement as he was. I'm not going to blame him for it at all because, I mean, that's not. We, we just made our choices, and some of them were pretty horrific, and some of them weren't. But we've reconnected here recently, and he's got an incredibly good wife with a good head on her shoulders, and... She's definitely somebody that has helped him grow, and I've been really blessed to see 
the man that he's become and the man that he's becoming, which has been really cool. I've enjoyed reconnecting with him. And because of life, we don't talk as much as we used to, but the times that we do talk are a lot more interesting than they were there for a while. So anyway, Josh, I wanted to say that because I, I felt some emotion yeah, from no, Brian there. So No, that's great. And Brian, I just want to, before I even... Yeah, Brian, I'm in the same, I'm in the same boat, Brian. Like, I, I very much feel you, man. Uh, like I said, I've, I've got the, you know, the one like ride or die, like, but he, you know, his job changed, right? Life happens. So I, was, I would say right now, literally like on a day to day, nobody, zero people in the circle to, to, to divulge stuff like that too. I think it's interesting that both Dave and Brian, you know, you, you do have limited, but the one thing you spark up a little bit about is fitness, whether that's powerlifting or, you know, Dave having your gym or Brian, you know, doing your karate or whatever. Like, I think there is something, and I'm probably speaking Flynn's love language here. There's something inherent in men's DNA. Feel better when we're doing shit. Like, it's just like today, you know, my... My youngest just turned 18, so we, he, we're in that adult transition of, you know, do you get a job? Do you go to the military? He doesn't want to go to school. My daughter and her boyfriend just moved back in with us. They're both, you know, 19, 20. And, you know, last night I was like, hey, tomorrow, yesterday was Father's Day. And I said, hey, tomorrow, let's make a plan. Let's work on the yard, work on the sprinklers. You know, my daughter's boyfriend, he just moved to, hey, I'll show you how to use our lawnmower and stuff. I'm just get you acclimated been showing my son how to do sprinklers food tastes better when you've been working in the yard for three hours water is colder when you've been doing shit beer tastes better like whatever it is that you sit down for five minutes that five minutes is always better when you've been doing something right it just always is and i think there is something so intrinsic in our dna that it's easier for us to open up at a gym or doing karate or, you know, whatever it is, mowing a yard, doing something, bullshit, whatever. Brian, I just want to encourage you, man. Don't, don't underestimate the power of those little 15 minute conversations that maybe you don't think are that big of a deal or don't mean that much to those guys. You might know, I mean, as small as your circle is, theirs might be smaller. You know, they might not even have a good wife or a good spouse, you know? So I just want to encourage both of you, Man, keep that up because dudes need that. Dudes need guys like Dave and Brian in those places just being you, just bringing that value and that worth. Circling all that back. So for me, my story kind of began. The only reason I'm here, uh, the way me and Flint met is you know, five years ago, I weighed over 400 pounds. I was a big mofo. I mean, I, my whole life. Dave, you talk about being a basement dweller. You know, we didn't have a basement, but I was a room dweller. You know, I'd hide fight food in my room. My first drug of choice from like the age of five was food. That was my first, I would, that's how I coped. You know, you, you hear about people self-medicating with weed or porn or women or addiction. My medication was food, donuts, peanut butter and jelly sandwich, syrup out of the bottle, frosting, Cheerios, whatever I can get my chubby little fingers on food and the best food was more like and that just morphed into teenage years when i found alcohol weed meth porn if there's something i can do be addicted to i'm going to do it and i'm going to do it to excess carry that all the way through marriage kids everything i am 40 2019 so this is five years ago i'm 42 edge of the bed right behind me I roll over, fat rolls, don't have a shirt on because when you're big and fat, you're always hot. It can be December and I still have my, I got a fan on right now. Just there's, I'm always sweaty. I roll over. I'm literally, I've already been in therapy for the last couple of months at this time. I just, a few months prior, I busted my, MR, my uh, meniscus and my ACL. My wife was working at a different hospital. When we went to the emergency room, I was too fat. For the MRI table, all they could do is x-rays because I was over the weight limit for the MRI table. Just a mess. And I rolled over and I, was, I literally told my wife, I said, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to die. I'm on a path to die. Either I'll do it myself or just this, the way I'm living is not going to work out. And I didn't have a plan. And there wasn't like, oh, do it for your kids. I, I'd been a dad. I'd felt like shit. I felt embarrassed going to games 
and you're like squeezing in between other parents or somebody drops something and you just look around because you can't too fat to pick it up or you're afraid you're going to not be able to get back up or going to graduations and they got those folding chairs that hold like 50 pounds max and I weigh 400, uh-uh, I'll stand in the back by the rafters. Like, but that wasn't enough. And so somehow, some way, the universe, God, karma, I don't know what, Andy, this was about the time Andy Frisella launched 75 Hard. I found 75 Hard. That just gave me a blueprint. I literally dumped everything I had into getting healthy and lost a whole bunch of weight. You know, lost like 200 pounds or so, 180 pounds. And I've kept it off since then. But the point to all of that was I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't have a plan. Wasn't motivated by my loved ones or a higher sense of power or God, I had to decide that I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I had to get to that place where it was just for me. And where that circles back to, to Flynn's question about, you know, what do you do with mental health or with anything else? Man, this is for you. When I go to the gym and I get up and work out, whether my guys are going to show up or not, man, I got to get up and go for me. And when I post the selfie of like, hey, I did my workout today, if nobody sees it, nobody likes it, nobody comments, I'm still going to get up and do it for me. And so this also ties into the forgiving your parents or forgiving anybody. Do that shit for you. Even if they're like, well, I don't need your forgiveness. I don't, you don't have, I have nothing to be forgiven for. Okay, whatever. I still forgive you. You're doing that for you. And so when you're having mental health stuff, have the conversations with the dudes at karate for you. And if they want to use it, that's their weakness, not you. Like if they want to bring it up to you later or like make you feel like shit about it, that's their issue. You know, it's like if somebody's got blackmail on me, tell me what you got and I'll post it right now. Because nobody's going to have shit on me. Like I'm not going to live in fear. I'm just not. And it's taken me 47 years to get there. And I've been called arrogant, prideful. I mean, you name it. It's just, I'm comfortable in my own skin now. Like, I know my heart. My heart is I want everybody to win. Like, I'm not out here like the alpha thing that you were talking about. Yeah, that shit drives me nuts. If you have to tell me you're the alpha, you're not the alpha. If you have to tell me I can trust you, I can't trust you. If You you know what I mean? Like, we'll know by how you live, right? You ever get around somebody and just tell, oh, this is a real dude. You know, you get around somebody like, oh, you're full of shit. (laughs) We just know, right? We know. And so my encouragement to anybody listening to this podcast or, you know, to you guys here today, you fellas is when you're sharing or you open up, do that for you. You're building that emotional muscle. Just like when you go to the gym, man, you're going to start with maybe a bar or maybe you start with 135 or maybe you start with 25 pound dumbbells. So what? I don't give a shit if the dude next to me is yakking 225 or you know, curling 80 pounds, whatever. That's you, bro. Like, these are my knees and my shoulders at 50 years old, okay? I'm going to do the best that I can for me. And I know what I can do and what I can't. Talk about it. Do the things. Journal. Go for a walk. Talk about your feelings. Read books about that shit. There's a lot of great books out there that deal with all of this. Listen to other podcasts. Do the work for you. And eventually, I believe in the law of attraction. Eventually, Brian, you keep having those conversations. You keep showing up for karate, for your mental, for your physical, for your emotional well-being. You're going to attract some dudes. You're going to get some dudes that are like, man, I noticed you're just real consistent. I noticed the other day you said something about, you know, just being a little off, a little depressed, a little upset. But you showed up anyways. Man, I've been going through whatever. We just never know. You know, that's my... That that's literally how my coaching practice started, man. Um, it, it was it was my buddy and I showing up five a.m. every day, right? Because because we needed it, um, and we found powerlifting because it was like, well, we we also felt like we needed a stake in the sand. But what was interesting is we showed up every day, consistent, and and kicking ass. Next thing you know, I got. At the time, a 17-year-old kid comes over. It's like, hey, you guys are pretty strong for old guys. I'll take it. I don't care anymore. I'll take it. Right? I'll take it, right? Yeah, I'll take it. Um, 
It's like, can I, can I start working out with you? And well, hell yeah. Let's do it, dude. Let's get everyone strong as shit. So yeah, he started working out with us. Um, that gym went bankrupt. We moved to another gym. Now there's three of us in there. Well, now some bodybuilder guy out of nowhere shows up. Hey man, you guys are pretty strong. I want to start doing, you know, can I work in with you? Now we got four. He's like, I know these two, you know, these two girls and they like powerlifting and getting strong too. Can they join in? Next thing you know, I'm coaching seven people, right? I didn't seek it. I didn't look for it. It just, or the, as you say, the universe just organically made stuff happen because I showed up um, and I wasn't showing up to accomplish that. I had I get, like, this was a career curve or life curve that I didn't even see coming. It wasn't even in my peripheral vision, but I'm following it because I'm, I'm just like, this is clearly this all happened for some reason. Right. And, and, but yeah, it was, it was just showing up and, and just being me and it, and it was nice. And then next, yeah. And then stuff oh, just, just happened. And so it has to be, like you said, Josh, it has to be for yourself. And it that's, to, and that's it for yourself. If you're going in and I, yeah, and, and that's to, to your point about the social media stuff, right? I, the one blessing I will say that we have as, a, as the Gen X generation is we didn't have that social media pressure. And so I can, I can comfortably be here. And when I started this, I was, I had just turned 40. I knew nobody gave a shit. Now I will say I've learned that people did, that people do follow me. And, and people do take some inspiration. I've had some really wonderful DMs over the years that I'm like, shit, man, that's awesome. I'm glad I'm, glad I'm helping you on your journey. I, don't, I didn't even know it, right? Uh, but I was, I was, it was just a log. It was, here's, a, here's my log and my accountability for myself that I've shown up every day. And this is how I'm personally using social media. Um, and yeah, and, and so I'm not there to impress anybody. If it does, cool. But I figure, like, like, again, I'm 50. I'm not breaking all time world records in thousand pound deadlifts. Not trying to be a daddy. I tell you what, right, <laughs> I can tell you right now, I'm, I'm, I'm kicking butt as a 50. Man, that's awesome. All of this. Holy shit. That's where old man energy came from, is my journey through 75 hard, which is where I met Josh because we were going through it at the same time. We were dealing with our own demons, so to speak. But if you go back and find the original hashtag for old man energy, it's a picture of me doing deadlifts. Cause I'm like, God, I'm really strong today. I got that old man energy. All of this came from that. And it was like, okay, well, yeah, there's other people following me. Josh, would, you may not even remember this, but with your permission, I'm going to share a story of the last phone conversation that we had. Open book, man. You share whatever the hell you want. Like I said, I can't be blackmailed. <laughs> well, here's, and, and you'll remember this conversation whenever I repeat it, but Josh and I have followed each other continuously since that time. We, we became friends over that, just talking back and forth on social media. I've had several phone conversations together and tried some different stuff that worked in the past and stuff that didn't work in the past and just all, all kinds of different stuff. But one thing that happens whenever you, you, you never know where those people in your tribe are going to come from. Because I know it was last year, I guess it was, it had to have been because I was in this house. So I was in the driveway when I was talking to him. And Josh was struggling. I think you were struggling with school. You were just, life was really heavy on your shoulders and his weight was going up and down and he would lose weight. And then he'd gain about 30 pounds back and 40 pounds back and he'd lose it again and back and forth. And I had two conversations with him because I got frustrated watching him do it. It was hurting me. And finally I asked him, he didn't listen to me the first time. He didn't even hear what I said, which was kind of weird. But the second time I called him and I'm like, dude, listen, if, it, if I had something to tell you that you might not like to hear, would you want me to would you want me to tell you? And he goes, yeah. He goes, I, I probably need to hear it. I said, do you identify as a fat guy who lost weight? Or do you identify as a slender guy who's fit now? And the silence from the other end of the phone was just deafening. And he was like, you know what? I've never looked at it that way. And I wasn't being a dick to him. I was just frustrated and watching my buddy struggle. I was like, okay, but wait, pause. that's that intentionality that comes with having people in your life that can be real so that when you need to say something positive or affirming, it has value. Like that had value and I believed you and I didn't think you were being a dick because of the previous several years of honesty 
and integrity and holding that line. So at that point, it had value. And you literally and still can say anything. And I'm not going to be, oh, you're being a dick. Continue. Yeah, no, and he's called he's called me on stuff, too. But usually it's been about, OK, you're going to continue making excuses or actually going to do something about it. <laughs> so Brian, I've had conversations like that over the years, too. It's been a while, but we've done that. So you, you don't know where your tribe's going to come from. You don't, you know, and they change over time too. But if you show up every day, authentic, being truthful, and you don't have to show, show up in the first time, just give an emotional dump on, on everybody that you meet going, Hey, this is where I'm at. That's not what we're talking about. But eventually you talk to somebody in small enough segments for long enough, they're going to get to know who the hell you are. I mean, Josh and I got to know each other over the course of several years just having short conversations. Some of our DM conversations, we, we'd have a, a hour's worth of conversation over the course of a week and a half because we were both busy. But we're jumping from different platforms, which gets really confusing when we go try and find something we talked about. Instagram, to text, to an email, to a text, to an email, yeah. to DM. It's the same conversation but through and through. So it's not easy to be vulnerable. It's not easy to open up. It's not easy to reach out for help when we actually need it. but we all should have somebody. And you know what? Ultimately, our spouse should be the first person that we open up to because they're the person we chose to walk through life with. Sometimes there are things we can talk about with them. So that sometimes there are things we need a guy's opinion on. If that irritates our spouse from time to time, it is what it is. But as long as we have a healthy relationship, they'll understand. Des doesn't necessarily like. She doesn't mind that I have guy relationships. She knows that I have to have them. She believes as much as it, all, all of us in here do that there's, that there's a tribe. But we, all, we want to believe that we are our spouse's superhero, that we are the one that can solve all their problems for them. I mean, that's just the way we are. But all three of you, in, in your answer to this question, explained basically the same thing, that your life started turning around when you started putting, putting effort and time into yourself, and you found your purpose. And when you found your purpose, you found your worth which brings us all the way back to the beginning of the conversation, which men have to have purpose and establish consistency before we have any value. And we feel this way and it's okay. I mean, it's the nature, it's nature of it. I, I, I don't feel bad about that. I don't want anybody to feel bad about that for me. I don't, I, I have to establish my purpose. I, I've, I've said it three times today. If I had discovered the power of social media 10 or 15 years ago or known how much I enjoyed either teaching or coaching people. And I, I don't do much fitness coaching, but I do life coaching and business coaching. My life would have taken a completely different direction. But you know what? I spent a long time chasing other things that weren't really my purpose. So I did, did, had the monochrome of success with that. I just wasn't very happy doing it. We've been on here a long time, guys. I'm going to ask you guys, do you have any final thoughts, anything you'd like to add, anything that we haven't touched base on that you'd like to, you'd like to put out there? Real quick, just let me piggyback on what you were saying to close. And I think this will help maybe a lot of people that may get hurt or offended. And as a therapist, maybe that's just my filter is a lot of times when people get offended or hurt, you know, they hear that value or worth and finding your purpose or finding your value or your worth. I think a lot of the trouble, a lot of that stems from when guys identify, oh, this guy can fix the brakes on a car replace, you know, garbage disposal. He lifts 500 pounds. He's super fit. He knows how to do all these things. That's what a man is. You know, he's a roofer or works in construction or he has this certain job or does a certain thing. Everybody. Quit falling in love with me, Josh. Everybody has a purpose. And your value comes when you really figure out what that is, because it's not going to be the same as everybody else. Dave is going to be able to go into a gym and speak to somebody from his experiences, from his battles, from his life choices and his life consequences. That's totally going to resonate with somebody that I could never even get through the surface of. Right. He has walked a path and he's accumulated experiences and stories. And it feels like he's starting to step into now what his real purpose is, what's really going to bring him some life and some joy and so. That's great. And yeah. that's not going to be the same as everybody. He doesn't have to be Flint. He doesn't have to be Josh. He needs to be Dave. And the problem is we get so caught up by bullshit or social media or TV or regular media of what we think a guy should be 
that we sit on the couch and we don't do shit. And then we're like, well, Flint said, if I don't bring anything to the table, I don't have value. Well, yeah, but you have a ton of value, but you're just sitting on your ass with it. Go do what it is that you were called to do because nobody else can. Go do it. <laughs> well, Josh, I, I think I think this goes back to the entitlement too in, in that you look at somebody else's success and then think, well, I'm, if I if I go do that, I should be entitled to the same thing. If I start lifting weights or repairing cars, I should have XYZ. Yep. I should be as entitled as, yeah, even though you don't take into account that, well, hey, maybe perhaps that guy's been in business for 10 years. Right? Filed bankruptcy and twice. If I can speak briefly on this, <laughs> yeah, um, that's kind of going back to when I touched on my entitlement journey. Uh, I was at a small, consult, so, uh, small consulting firm in Naples, uh, Florida. Um, I, I felt like I had a lot of good skills. A guy came in after me, like he was hired, you know, a good six months to a year after me. Um, and he got a promotion. So what do I do? What do you think I did in that situation? Why didn't I get promoted? I've been here longer. I'm doing just as many hours. I'm bringing just as much billable time. I should be getting promoted. Right. Well, behind the scenes, and it took several years for me to to, to finally let the ego come down and, and realize what had happened is, you know, this guy um, went through a bunch of certification courses. Right. He put in realistically more effort than I was putting at the time. But my ego at that moment as a, as a young man in my early 20s would not let me see that. That early 20 ego. And, you know, real. I can see it now and I can reflect <laughs> on it now. Yeah. Oh, it's tough. Yeah. But I felt entitled being in the same industry to his position, even though I honestly, realistically didn't do anything to deserve it. That's fair. Brian, you got anything you want to add to that before we wrap it up? I don't have anything to add, I don't think. I have a ton of questions now. But well, in, any, any of them talks. top of mind that you want to ask while well, you got all three of us here? Well, I don't know. I don't know how long we got, but I am one of the ones that came to mind first because, you know, being yourself has come up a few times and authenticity has come up a few times. I'm, I'm curious. Do y'all have a strong sense of who you are as an individual and do you have any, um, like, concrete way that you came to understand that about yourself yeah does that make sense yeah, a lot of, a lot of pain and bullshit <laughs> making a lot of mistakes picking myself up off the floor after getting smacked in the crotch enough like uh, i'll give you some i'll give you some examples brian um if that's okay basically i learned by realizing all the stuff that i sucked at because I was forced into a lot of things that I sucked at at an early age. Okay. Uh, as you see, I have glasses. So my vision, my vision is horrible. And one of the most traumatic experiences that I, I carry to this day at 50, um, is that I could not hit a ball in baseball. I could not, I didn't have oh, the death perception. That, that really hits because I was, I was terrible at T-ball. And after I quit T-ball, Found out I needed glasses, so I've been wearing bifocals since I was in third grade. So the eyesight and the baseball thing that 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 that, that hits. And it and, it, and you know I, I had a, a coach that literally said we're gonna we're not gonna end practice until Dave hits a ball. Now imagine what that oh, does to you, like a that, kid. Man. Oh man, I was like I finally hit one. The lights were out at the park. Like it was like a good hour, two hours after practice, right? But it was years of that of my parents like, oh, let's try soccer. Not good in soccer. But that brings me full circle to the weightlifting. And one thing that I fundamentally believe, fundamentally believe my core, regardless of your condition or station of life, every single person out there can get stronger physically and, and mentally. Right. And so that's I think that's why I eventually gravitated to weightlifting in high school and as, as a young man and then back, you know, after the kids and the family, and you know, you spend that decade, that kind of like lost decade for a lot of us came back to it because that's the one thing I could do. You can always pick up a, you can pick up a barbell, right? If you got one arm, you can pick up a barbell. If 
you got one leg, you can still do a leg extension, right? It doesn't matter. And we've, and, you know, and we see it now all the time. speaking my love language. Now. Hell yeah. Yeah, mine too. Yeah. I didn't. Uh, really long story short. So, so to, to your point, Brian, yeah, it's, 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 I found all these things that I wasn't good at. I changed majors three or four times because uh, the ADD meant I couldn't read. I, like, I, I would read chapters and this, it was just gone. Okay, like it yeah. was yeah. freaking hard getting through college. Like I dropped, so I, I went from computer science um, to actuarial science to nuclear engineering, back to computer science, then took a big long break <laughs> to where I'd accumulated essentially enough life stuff and my brain had developed enough connections to where I could start processing the college stuff at a later time in life. So I, I ended up getting my bachelor's sure. degree at 33 and I literally just got my master's last year at 49. Congratulations. Wow. Pretty good. That's how old. So better late than never. That's, I guess. that's how old I'll be when I get yeah, my, man. my master's. Right. I graduate in 2026. Yeah. Um, that's awesome. So there's there's some old man energy for you, man. I just I don't quit, dude. I, if it takes me fifty years to do it, Brian, I'll do it. what are you gonna say, Jeff? College that actually opens up a lot. Absolutely, Brian. Brian, yeah. college wasn't even on my radar. I was a high school dropout. One of my proudest moments uh, was this year. My youngest son graduating. All three of my kids graduated from the school I dropped out of in my junior year. Like I was a high. School I was oh, a really? high school dropout. I thought it'd be a uh, better use of my time selling weed out of my garage than going to school. Got behind on credits. I think I made it three months into my junior year, and I said, see you later. Again, no dad to force me. My mom was kind of doing her own thing. Sure. I was polite and respectful to my mother, you know, that raised on that Gen X, you know, you don't talk back. I was a hellion, but I was polite to mom, you know. So I dropped out of high school. College wasn't on my radar. I was just a hard-ass worker. And great with people. I can bullshit. I could talk. Started selling vacuums. Got into retail. I could hustle. At 19 or 20, I got hired on as an assistant manager for block or uh, Hollywood Video. No managing experience. I just bullshitted my way through the interview. Like, so I just worked my whole way through in life. You know, job to job to job. Got married, and then about 2016, no, 2013, 2013, 2012. My wife and I shit storm personal stuff, all kinds of crazy stuff. She decided she didn't want to be a stay at home mom anymore. She's like, I can't do this. She went back to school. And I said, that's fine. I support that. Kids are getting old enough to be in daycare or whatever. They were in school, like kindergarten, you know, we'll figure it out. She goes to school, still not on my radar. I, n not even on my radar. It was that day laying in my bed when I was so overweight and depressed that I was suicidal. The first step was just getting healthy. That was in like February of 2019, January, February, March, right in there. I had no plan to like, oh, I'm going to be, a th I'm going to do this. I just need to lose weight. Once I lost, started losing some weight and I started thinking about my mental, I was like, man, I wish I would have had a therapist that had the experience of addiction and trauma and bullshit. Somebody that had gone through some stuff that I did, somebody that I could talk to and would shoot it to me straight. I was like, I need to. I, that's that's it. That's what I need to do. Like when I realized that that whole of me that there wasn't a therapist just like me that existed because I I'm the one. That's when I go shit. I'm going back to school. My wife's like do it. So and I always tell people. So I didn't even go back to school until I was 42. No no bachelor's. No AA. No credit. Nothing. Nothing. I first English class I took just comprehension English. There was a girl in there when they ro roll called and said the last name. She goes, are you Joey Supreme's dad? I'm like, who? The, who? Like Joey. Do you know somebody named Joey? I go, I know a Joseph Canalora who really sucks at doing dishes and needs a haircut. And she goes, Oh my God, I think you're Joey Supreme's dad. I'm like, we're going to have to just, who is Joey Supreme? It's like Joey Supreme. In high school, he'd buy all this shit Supreme stuff and resell it at school. It's like a collab company or whatever. Anyways, yeah. First college class, I'm in school with this girl that just graduated high school with my son. So 
Yeah. That's a so wow. big moment. <laughs> it was. It was. Yeah. Another psychology class we talked about flashbulb memory. And it's basically when a major world event happens, everybody remembers where you were, right? So if I said 9 11, most of us can remember where we were on 9 11. Yep. I brought that up in class. Oh, yeah. Nobody in my class was born. Damn, you old, <laughs> man. By, by the way, I just, uh, I, I don't want it to, because I, you know, Josh, you and I both come from a, obviously a college background. Uh, that's not to say that college no, is necessary. No, absolutely I not. I don't feel it's necessary. I don't know that my kids are even going to go at this point. Uh, we, I can, but it's yeah. never too late. I can, I can speak you, to that piece of it. Yeah. Trade, but yeah, but it's never, but it's never trade school, yet. start a business, start a podcast, go to school, don't go to school. It's never too late to pivot. That's my only point. It's never too late to yeah. pivot. And yeah, I don't know where, I don't know where you're at, Brian. Uh, I, you said you did flooring and tile or something like that. Is that right? Basically, uh, maintenance and restoration, refinishing. Okay. Is that, is that your own business or, or, uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. I actually awesome. I yeah. did go to I have a actually have a bachelor's in graphic design. Um, don't really do it anymore. And he yeah. he gave That's he right. gave me credit for, yeah, for learning know. flooring from me, learning flooring restoration. Dude, the the stuff he does with floors is magic. He's way better at that shit than I ever was. I he's given me he's he's being nice because he gave he me credit for it. But go look mind. at his page, man. Some of the restorations <laughs> that he's done in the concrete polishing is yeah. just gorgeous. It's, it's nothing. It's nothing short of art. I guess, I guess I'm. Using oh, I'm, oh, I bet. My art and, you know, that's the thing. Is, yeah, you, you show up and do that authentically, and start to, you know, b- believe that it's good, authentic. Like that, you have the skill, right? Because uh, it's needed. I tell you, hundred percent, it's needed. I can't find a fucking good flooring guy out here at all. So I, I, I tell you right now, it's absolutely needed. I, I had to tear up my shit because they did the. Fucking the uh, ceramic paste wrong. They just did the little swirlies instead of actually doing, you know, back buttering and all the stuff. I know a little bit of the terminology, but they, they did not do it the right way. I definitely know that. Um, and so I'm, I'm sitting That's literally crazy. on a concrete floor gentlemen, right now. Gentlemen, we are yeah, we are out account. of time. I think my, my producer is going to yeah. quit if I give her much more channels to work with at this point. So listen, guys, it. it this has been a great discussion and I appreciate every single one of you guys being here. And hopefully you guys out there listening have taken something away from this. You're going to get access to all these guys, social media, be able to send us some questions, but man, if you got questions or follow-ups for these guys, or you're just one of the guys out there that's feeling alone and you're not sure where to go or what to do, send us a message, respond in the comments. You guys know that I respond to as much of the comments as I possibly can, and it will come to the, to our attention. But the important thing is to get out there, find your purpose, chase your dreams. You, If you commit to something, you discover it's not something you like to do, you are allowed to change your mind. You have infinite shots on goal. It does not matter. You can start over again at 20, at 30, at 40, at 50. It's irrelevant as long as you find your purpose and keep moving forward. The world needs you and it needs our authenticity, every single one of us. Thank you again for joining in. Make sure that you like and you subscribe and you follow. Go follow these guys. You're going to find some massive content on their social media. Some of us are on Insta. Some of us are on Facebook. Hell, some of us are everywhere. Go follow us. Give us some interaction. Let us know. Love y'all. Peace. Peace.